Our first speaker is Anastasia Dimitropoulos, and she's going to be talking about preliminary results from the PRETEND program. And we are very lucky to have Anastasia here. She's a research psychologist at Case Western Reserve, and her research examines the cognitive and behavioral and emotional aspects of children with a variety of developmental disabilities. Much of her research has focused on exploring the phenotype profile of Prader-Willi syndrome, including food and non-food behavior. Anastasia, I've worked with her quite a bit. She is a very careful and thoughtful researcher and has really contributed a huge amount to our understanding of the social and cognitive challenges in Prader-Willi syndrome, especially in young kids. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Oh, perfect. That's it. Will work. Thank you. I wore my heels today so you could see me better than the other day when you couldn't see me at all. So, um, so thank you to FPWR for inviting me to come and tell you a little bit about the work. Um, we have results today, so I'm excited. We've been telling you about uh, the research coming out of my group for a while and telling you about play and pretend play and why it's important. Um, before I get started, I just want to highlight for those of you who have, already who have already participated or are participating in our program, you all know that most of the work that is done in my lab is done by a very talented group of young women, um, including Elena Zyga and Ellen Dornberg, who do a lot of the intervention work, um, a lot of the on-the-ground work for these projects. So I just want to make sure that I acknowledge that even though you're in my study, I may not recognize you face to face because I don't see you through our um, intervention as often as they do. So my goal today is to um, refresh your memory or, and tell um, people who are new to or are not familiar with our program what the Pretend program is. I'd like to share with you our first wave of results. Uh, we collected data on, a, on our first set of individuals and have now gone through the very laborious task of um, of doing coding and reliability of our variables and are presenting those to you today. And then I'll talk a little bit about how we've tweaked the intervention for wave two and that's where we're currently enrolling now in what this might mean as we move forward. So if you weren't already familiar, play and pretend play specifically is really important to social cognitive functioning. It's linked to many um, skills that children need as they develop, both social skills and cognitive skills. And, um, and the wider audience uh, is starting to really push this for parents to become more involved in making sure their children have active time to play. And so this news flash is from the New York Times report in August that announced that the American Academy of Pediatrics is now asking um, pediatricians to prescribe play. You may already know that they prescribe reading um, to young children, to young families, and now play is also something that they feel they need to direct attention to parents because our society has turned um, very much to organized activities. There's a lot less time for children to play. So I just want to highlight the importance of having this space for children to work out ideas and to work out some of their emotional challenges. So what is our pretend program? This is a play-based program where we're delivering it remotely. Our goal here is to be able to reach individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome um, who are not local to us in a way that may be meaningful for us to advance interventions in this population and, um, and be uh, helpful to very busy families, right? So coming in for intervention twice a week um, with your child is, is difficult with a busy schedule. And so we are trying to um, implement or test the feasibility of this program uh, that's delivered remotely. Um, it's an enrichment-based program, and it's meant to enhance development. And so I think of it as both um, optimizing best play skills, so teaching parents how to be great play partners and finding the best way to, um, to enrich their experiences with their child, and also using a play space to work on some challenges that kids with Prader-Willi syndrome are having. And this may be somewhat individual to the child's needs. Uh, this program is being tested in preschool age children through parent training 
and through school-age children with direct child intervention. So today I'm going to talk primarily about this parent training component with our preschoolers. And I'll say one thing about our school-age children um, at the end as it relates to our second wave of data collection. And so we know from other populations that parent training is um, effective in both increasing social engagement and decreasing behavior problems. So um, programs that are delivered in um, autism spectrum disorder have been shown to be helpful for um, parents to increase this engagement with their children. We also know that early in intervention is important for building play and engagement. And we know from our previous findings that kids with PWS have some trouble playing. Play for typical children um, often comes naturally. And for our population, it often is, is a little bit harder, a little bit um, less natural and needs a little bit more direction and work. <coughs> So our goal here was to transition um, the findings that we know um, to be occurring in our kids with PWS in a way that we can intervene. Um, and so we're limited potentially by the fact that we don't have a lot of kids in Cleveland um, at this age range that can come in for intervention, so we're using a remote platform to do so. And so our goals of our study, of the, of the data I'm going to talk about today, are one, to just compare what are our play skills like and our social cognitive ability like in PWS, um, both genetic subtypes, um, compared to typical development and compared to children with autism spectrum disorder at this age range. We don't have a lot of literature in PWS on three to six year olds, and so this is a way for us to really get at what's happening during this time period with both parent report measures and observable measures. And then our second aim was to decide, is what we're doing working? We know it's feasible. We've established that parents are okay with it. It's acceptable to them. They enjoy doing it. But now we're thinking about, is it actually doing anything for the parent and for the parent and child um, together? <clears throat> so um, I'll just go through this very quickly. The structure of our program right now is that we see people live and in person before they start the intervention and live and in person after they finish the intervention. We see them um, through video conferencing for six weeks, twice a week. Um, for about 30 to 45 minutes, and these are individual educational sessions that are designed to boost imagination and play skills, teach parents how to be good play partners, um, show them tools to work on engagement with emotional recognition and regulation and social communication. In addition, depending on if the child is having behavior issues, flexibility issues, then we work that into um, showing them techniques to work that into play as well. So our results from baseline, so this is our first aim, is just to see across the populations how are they doing. And what we find is that overall, as we would expect, kids with prader willi syndrome are faring better than our kids with autism spectrum disorder on most measures, um, but lower than our neurotypical group. And this is something we would expect based on the previous literature in PWS, that they're not at neurotypical levels for everything, um, and that they're doing a little bit better than our kids with ASD, um, even when we control for cognitive ability. Not surprising, though, we see um, not surprising, we see those, these findings consistent with our older children with PWS. However, we've seen some key differences that I think we'd like to highlight. Um, so here are our participants. We have about 30 children with Prader-Willi syndrome, broken up by genetic subtype status, 20 kids with autism, and 26 neurotypical kids. We have nice age and gender matching um, for these groups. We do have some receptive language and some general mental ability um, differences across our groups with our typical group performing higher than our clinical populations and with our UPD group having some more trouble with receptive language and visual reception than, than our deletion group. And so we'll investigate that a little bit further as well as we move forward, but we've controlled for that in our analyses. And so when we think about pretend play, there are characteristics of pretend play that are really important. Um, so the complexities of play are, um, are such that some behaviors are linked to 
um, cognitive, other cognitive functions and other social functions. So these three um, sections of the graph show you some qualities of pretend play. The first is how imaginative is the play. The middle one is how comfortable is the child playing in the situation. And the third, closest to me, is organization. How organized is the play? And I know these, um, sorry, these labels are a little small. So red is typical, PWS deletion is green, orange is MUPD, and ASD is in blue. I want to direct your attention most to our orange or our MUPD group. Here what we're seeing is that our kids with MUPD are having some trouble with um, having imagination incorporated into their play, so playing imaginatively, and, and I'll show you more on that in a minute, and how organized their play is. So as they're playing, how organized is the story that they're, that they're working through? When we look at the amount of time spent in play, so what we do is we have people complete a five-minute play session where, um, where the, the experimenter gives the child a set of toys. They start them with a, with a prompt, and so that they're playing together for the first few seconds, and then the child moves from that prompt to play however they like with the toys. And then we look at, we measure this, um, this time period for the amount of time that's spent playing, playing functionally, so for example, taking a car and rolling it across a table, um, or whether they're playing symbolically or imaginatively. So in this case, maybe they take a block and make it a rocket ship and take it to the moon. And so what we see here again, if, we, um, if I can orient you to the orange bar, is that our kids with UPD, MUPD are spending more time not playing during this session than the rest of the groups, and they're having um, a harder time engaging in this symbolic play, um, presenting more similarly to our autism group than our group of kids with paternal deletion. When we look at parents and chi children playing together, we also ask parents and children, we ask one parent and, a chi and the child to engage in a five minute play task. We give them a different set of toys and we say, play however you want for five minutes, we videotape it, and then we code that behavior. And we're coding for a number of factors on the parent side and on the child side. On the parent side, what we're finding is that for our clinical groups, both PWS and ASD, we're finding that um, parents are in involved a little bit more in the play, and I, I want to say over-involvement. Maybe they're inserting themselves a little bit more, and they're also at, or giving help more than it is requested. Okay? And so in, in the rating scales that we're using, this is not seen positively, but seen more negatively, that there's over-involvement, but not joint play. Um, our groups also show, for on the child side, they show less social interest and social competence in their play. So that kind of makes sense. If you're having a hard time playing, the parent is more involved and in trying to help out with that play. <clears throat> when we look at our parent reportive measures, um, the social communication questionnaire is a commonly used measure of um, a checklist of whether the child's going to meet criteria for autism spectrum disorder or not. And what we find is that there's a little bit more variability in our UPD group as we would expect based on older children and adolescents with PWS. Um, and we see differences between this group and our deletion group. So even at preschool age, before hyperphagia is um, really coming on full, we're seeing these social cognitive challenges differing in these genetic subtypes. And so this is um, pretty important to note. We also see consistently that, um, that this, this decrease is consistent with other measures of parent report of functioning. So I think one of the most important take-home points from this data, though, is that our parent report seems to be matching our observed variables. One of the things that we're concerned about in Prader-Willi syndrome is we get a lot of parent report on what, what is happening, right? And here what we see is that our parents are reporting behavior that we are also seeing um, in our videos of play as well. So for example, if the parents are reporting higher social functioning and um, higher higher social functioning for their child, we're seeing that in the parent-child engagement, okay? Separate and blinded to whether, we don't know this when we code it, right? We're coding social 
um, interest in social competence in the child, and we're seeing that relating to the parent's report of their child's functioning. We're also seeing that if the child is um, performing more, uh, having decreased social interest and competence in their play, these parents, parents of those children are reporting greater parental stress. Okay, so we're seeing this linkage between parental st stress or burden and lower social competence in children. We also see that those who um, are reporting lower social communication challenges, if parents are reporting that their children are doing better with social cognitive behavior, then that this is linked with greater comfort in play and more likelihood to engage in this creative play. So these are important findings in this, in this age range because we know that what parents are reporting is matching up with what we're seeing. So when we look at our intervention, our sample sizes are about 15, or 15 each for whether they had the intervention or whether they were assigned to our wait list group. Um, our samples are matched on these basic demographic abilities, and we don't have enough children at this point to look at subtype differences. So all the, all the findings that I'll report are for children with PWS who either had the intervention or are in the waitlist group, regardless of genetic subtype. And what we find is that after intervention, for those who are in the intervention group, we see higher reported good quality play skills, so having characters talk to each other. That's increasing after the intervention. That's great, right? We aren't seeing a lot of differences in the type of play that they're doing, and I'll come back to that on why it might be important to look at how we've changed the intervention for the next wave. We're also seeing an increased number of themes used in play, so children are not just sticking with the first theme, but going on to talk about more things or start story stems that are different than the original theme presented. After the intervention, for our intervention group, parents are reporting uh, decreased stress related to child behavior, and on a separate measure, they're, they're indicating decreased child behavior problems, so decreased externalizing behaviors like acting out, and possibly some de decreased internalizing behaviors as well. So parents are reporting that after the intervention, their children's behavior is changing. When we look at our parent-child interaction, and this is, I think, where um, we thought we would see the most change, right? We're working with parents to um, teach them to be better play partners and incorporate some of these skills in their play with their children. And so what we see after the intervention is that the enjoyment in play and the actively active involvement of play between children, child and their parent is more similar to typical children after the intervention than um, our waitlist group. Our waitlist group does not see any changes. This is actually, this measure is a little counterintuitive. Our um, typical group is right here in red and lower scores are better on this measure, and so what we see is our PWS intervention group decreases from time one to time two, where our intervention group does not. And so what we're seeing is that there's more parental involvement and engagement with the child in play than at um, baseline. So what does this mean for um, wave two? As I said, our pre to post intervention results showed some changes, but not as many as we would have thought. And one of those reasons may be because our preschool intervention is targeted just at parents, there was no engagement with the child during the intervention. So for wave two, we've changed this. We've listened to parents and realized that you all have very busy schedules. So instead of twice a week, we've modified it to once a week and extended it by two weeks. So instead of six weeks, we've moved it to eight weeks. Um, and we've assigned more homework and practice skills in between sessions so that parents are getting a chance to practice the things that the interventionist is working with them on video record it for us so that we can review it and then provide feedback. So there's a little bit more um, involvement of the child and those practice skills going on. We've also incorporated live coaching sessions. One of the things that parents report to us is, 
oh, I never thought about that. I haven't tried it. Or how do I even do that? How do I engage with my child in that way? And so using a live coaching session allows us to be in their ear while they're playing through, um, through a scene with the child and be able to give them advice as they're doing it. Okay. Um, and so we're using that in our second wave of data. Our hopes are now with wave two, with these adjustments, that we'll also see increases in the domains that we expect to see in our school age children. And so I don't have um, the slide on our school age children, but I did say, uh, I presented this the other day at the scientific conference, for our school age children that are getting direct intervention, where we're working directly with the child and not doing parent training, what we're finding is that do those domains in imagination and organization are changing from pre to post for our intervention group. And they're gaining in those skills. So we're seeing those increases in play with our school age children. By modifying our preschool intervention to incorporate more um, child-focused practice with the parent, we're expecting those changes in our preschool ages as well. So our take-home points today is that we know um, from our, we presented on this uh, and just recently got a paper accepted that we know from parent feedback that this is feasible, that it's acceptable method to do intervention. This is remote video conferencing, so they set up an appointment from their home and talk to our interventionist through the computer. Um, at baseline, our kids with PWS and with autism are showing lower social cognitive skills than our typical peers. Um, this is consistent with what we see in older ages with PWS, but this is the first that we're reporting it in this young of age. Um, and I think what's critical is that we're seeing direct observation um, results indicating that kids with MUPD are at increased risk of having these social communication communication challenges at the preschool age, which really means we need to think about intervening early for these kids. Um, after intervention, for our intervention group, what we're seeing is significant or trending gains within this group on parent-child engagement measures and in play, and so we're excited about this, and we, see, we don't see these differences in the waitlist group. And so our practical implications, because some of you may be like, I have a lot to do with my child. They have a lot of challenges, and play was not something I was thinking about. I think we need to think about, for this age range, play is a space to work on other things. Um, and so using that time period effectively is really important. And so kids with PWS need that time um, to, they need that assistance in bolstering play skills, in bolstering um, flexibility during that play, um, so that then that can map on to other areas of, of their life and other challenges that they're experiencing in. Um, I think working remotely with parents may impact these skills and also may impact that ch parent child engagement, which is really important during these early years as well. So I'd like to. Thank FPWR for um, um, helping support this program of research and certainly our families who have contributed so far and, um, and our many, many assistants who have coded these tapes. So I just want to point out that when we say we observe these um, behaviors on video, what we're doing is we are blinding our coders to whether it's an intervention or a waitlist family, whether it's before the intervention or after the intervention, whether the child has PWS or autism or is neurotypical, and they're just watching videos, and they're coding, and they're coding it to reliability. So these tapes are watched over and over again, and multiple people are rating them. So it's a big, arduous process. So um, they've done a lot of work for this project. I'll take questions, but I'll also say that we are currently still enrolling. We're going to be in the Northeast in early December um, in the Boston and Connecticut area if anyone's interested in participating. We are really looking for school-age families. We have a lot of preschool families that are, um, uh, that are showing interest and are coming up, but we are looking for more school-age families. We go up to the age of nine. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank Is you. this one on? Or is it just me talking? Hello? Um, let's take a few questions, and then we'll have Elizabeth Roos talk, and we'll take a few questions after that. So, 
I don't know if it's out, outside of the scope of that particular research, but um, it seems like it'd be interesting to have uh, a peer play option um, at baseline and at post, at least, and find out how that's affecting their peer play. Absolutely. So this is something that we would love to incorporate, um, and even just teacher reports. So in our wave two, I, I forgot to mention we are um, we're looking at pre and post and also follow up. And so we're getting anecdotal reports from parents that re that are reporting that teachers and caregivers outside the home are reporting that their imagination skills are going up, they're playing more, they're initiating contact with friends, um, but certainly we would like to see that peer-to-peer -peer play. In um, some of our uh, work that led to this, we did see that joint play increased skills for our kids with PWS. So when the child was playing alone, once we added a play partner, an adult play partner, those play skills increased. So we do want to be able to see that. We don't have that built into this project, but that's something that we need to look at. Um, if we took part in the first part of this, are we eligible to take part in the second part? Or are you looking for all new participants? Unfortunately, we, we need to look at new participants, yes. But thank you for participating. I, I have a question. Is there, since um, some of these issues are showing up, especially in the UPD subgroup, is there kind of a recommendation or a suggestion you would give to parents who have young kids in that area about getting early intervention in this area? I do. So I, I would certainly say that. Um, I was somewhat surprised to see these distinctions this early with observed play, right? So um, as I said, our coders don't know the literature on genetic subtype differences and what they should be looking for, and they also don't know um, who has what. So um, I certainly think if I had a child with MUPD that I would be looking at getting um, intervention on this early, right, and talking to your providers about making sure we get some intervention in place for social. And are there certain providers that do this kind of work early on? I'm thinking occupational therapists, speech uh, therapists. Sure, okay. yes. All of the, all the um, interventionists that are working with the child, the preschool as well, should be mindful of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't we do one more question and then we'll move on. Um, were any of your participants from that first phase already hyperphagic? That's a good question. So we have, because we're doing a combined study with Vanderbilt for wave two, we will have hyperphagia nutritional phase on our second wave. But on our first wave, do we have HQCT? We haven't looked at it yet, but we might have HQCT. But we don't have nutritional phase. So in general, from what we see in wave two, most of these children are in phase 2B, I would say. Um, most are not in, they're either entering um, stage three or they're in 2A transitioning to 2B. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Everybody, warm. Thank you. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you very much, Anastasia. I was going to help you escape, but I don't know if I know oh, how to do it's that. It's a little. This has been our biggest stress of this whole meeting. It's been the, it's the slide. Okay, you have to hit. Okay. There you go. I got other markers. Okay. I'm sort of helping Elizabeth. You'll know how to do this when you get up here, but. <laughs> Okay, so I want to introduce our next speaker, Elizabeth Roof. She's a senior research specialist at Vanderbilt University. She has spent her career studying Prader-Willi syndrome and individuals with other developmental disabilities. She takes a whole person approach to addressing and preventing mental health and behavioral challenges in people with Prader-Willi syndrome. She's been a true advocate in the community and has run several clinical trials, has won many awards for excellence in research. I could go on and on, but I'd rather let her start speaking. <laughs> Let's welcome Elizabeth. <laughs> Oh, yes, we have to go to your, yeah, we'll this is yours, right? This. Yeah. Okay, I'll let you do it. That should be. Is it? 
Yep, smart possum. <laughs> and I can just use the down keys, right? Yeah, I don't need to use that. Yeah, I'm not, I can't. I can't handle the remote. Right, okay. Okay. Awesome. Thanks everybody for being here. And so I'm going to kind of build on what Anastasia said and talk a little bit about the social skills training that we did at Vanderbilt and have actually finished collecting data and are actually in that arduous task of coding videotapes. It's always fun to, hey, hey, here's what you'll be doing. Uh, and so we're going to be doing that and are looking forward to actually talking about that soon. But we'll be talking mostly about the intervention itself and kind of what people with PWS are good at. Oh, no, went too far. So what do we know about social skills in PWS? Well, you know, we don't know a lot, but we do know that they really do like animals. I have, I have almost all the kids and adults that I see really love animals. Some of them really like puzzles. And so we were thinking about doing a lot of it, trying to focus on animals and things that they like and things that they enjoy. We didn't even have to bother because as soon as we started running groups, a lot of the conversations went to, what kind of dog do you have? What's its name? And things like that. So it was perfect. Uh, so. What they say isn't true. People with PWS don't all have autism. They're not just interested in food. They, they do want friends, and they are interested in other people. And they can't have normal interactions because of food. I mean, that's not true. And because of food, they can't participate in usual ways, like parties, dances, sleepovers. Again, we think that for a lot of them, if you can actually keep them safe, they can participate in a lot of social and, and activities. And we find that parents find ways to socialize even with food issues. So they find ways to kind of keep them safe. And we do know that they're socially motivated and they want friends, but we've been talking to some of our folks for over 20 years, and the things that they always talk about is, I want friends, I'd like a girlfriend, I would like people who know me, who get me, things like that. And so we decided this is a great way to do it. And because we've always seen people face to face, and we used to do clinical trials, and there's three or four people at a time in a trial at, at the hospital, we'd, they'd say, I want to meet somebody else with PWS. So they'd walk into the room and they'd go, hi. I'm like wow, this is going to be a long day. They really struggle with the social skills. So they're motivated, but they don't know what to say. They don't know how to make friends. So we came up with an idea of looking at social skills for 23 years. What are they good at? We talked to parents. We talked about what their kind of wants and needs are. We talked to a lot of people with PWS who told us that they did want friends. So one of the things that we did is we actually had them watch short movie clips of kids interacting. And so some of the kids are nice and some are mean. And we tried to see if they could tell the difference, and it was really interesting. We, what do you notice? What do they ignore? And, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that and also about some emotional recognition because this laid the base work for us doing the boss uh, social skills training. You have to figure out what people are so that you can actually move them to where you want them to be. So as far as social connection, cognition, it's about how we perceive emotions, intentions, and behaviors of, of ourselves and others. It's being able to take another person's perspective, being able to recognize the emotional states of others, and being able to use cues to draw inferences about social uh, situations. We know that these are impaired in PWS because of the things that we've done, and they're not all about cognitive ability. So we have a fair number of folks who have almost normal intelligence and who really are pretty high functioning, but they still struggle with this stuff. So it seems to be more about PWS and maybe about some other deficits. So some of the deficits we notice is that people have problems about the back and forth of social communication. They really struggle. Is it processing? Is it something else? And what we notice is that they have really, their, their social overtures are really, they say hi, they may have one or two scripted questions they ask people, but you know, even when we would have things that we would volunteer about ourselves, they could never pick up on them. There's one thing we're playing with them, kind of like what Anastasia was saying, it's like, kind of like a scripted play. And I would, you know, they would play, be playing with a horse, they go, my daughter rides horses. Well, the appropriate thing would be like, oh, what is your daughter's name? What kind of horse does she ride? I mean, something, but what they would say is, I'm playing with the horse and I'm doing my thing and I don't know what you're talking about. So they really had a hard time picking up on social cues. So we knew that that was all true. And so for us, it was trying to figure out about facial expressions, you know, things like fear, anger, happy, sad, disgust, surprise, and try to figure out, you know, using these kind of standardized faces, kind of what are people thinking and feeling. So we did the social videotape vignettes using child actors and we had 94 kids, youth and adults with PWS, and we had them at two time points. And what was interesting is everybody with PWS recognized happy. But what about the other emotions? What are these people feeling? We don't know, right? So we tried to get them to show them all these pictures of faces to see how people were feeling. 
what are they looking at? Are they looking at the right thing? And what we notice is they often didn't. So when it came to fear, only 30 to 60% of kids and adults, they did not get better with age, recognize fear over chance levels, even if they look like this. SAD, only 50 to 60% of the kids and adults recognize SAD over chance levels. This was really shocking to us. We did not think they were this bad, but they really weren't good at it. But 80% recognized anger. They knew that. You're mad at me. Why are you yelling at me? Why are you mad at me? I didn't do it. Why are you yelling at me? They really did notice anger. And the more they focused on anger and tone of voice, the more they actually kind of got anger. But what we found is that any high emotional state also got translated into anger. So even if you're excited or, you know, high, you know, animation, they often think that's anger. So you guys know that when your kids think everyone's yelling at them, sometimes you're not yelling at them. So as far as social perceptions in PWS, they generally did pretty well over time. They did get better as they got older. They, they knew when people were lying. They knew about trickery. They knew about deception and rejection. But what they didn't do really well was is that when somebody actually sincerely apologized, they didn't get that. So if somebody, there was a, a girl in a hallway with a bunch of books and somebody accidentally bumps into them, and the girl who bumps into her goes, I'm so sorry, I should have been watching where I was going. So we asked kids with PWS, is that mean? They're like, oh yeah, it's mean. She knocked all of her books out of her hands. And I'm like, yeah, but she said she was sorry and it was an accident. And they're like, they truly believe that there are no accidents. They feel like everything happens to them. It's personal. You're doing it to me. And we notice that these things do not improve over time. So they really do stink at being able to kind of understand people's motivation. So what we found is that the more emotional cues there are where people got upset when, when somebody had wronged them, they seem to do better at that. They need a lot of stronger emotional expressions to kind of uh, understand social interaction. So I tell people it kind of has to be in your face for them to actually get what things are happening in social situations. So why are they better with negative? A lot of people think that just because they're negative, that's why they're better at negative. But what we will say is that even for typical folks, we notice things that are negative. If somebody cuts you off in traffic or does something to you, you, you kind of process that. You probably can think of lots of even episodes when you were a kid where somebody did something really mean to you that you can really recall vividly. We have a certain ability to kind of carry things like that because they have a lot more priority and they, that emotional stuff kind of stays with us. So that is definitely true for them too. So there's greater attention and, and processing of negative stimuli. We, as, we ascribe a lot more complexity to the negative stimuli, like people really have this kind of out to get us thing. And so just like the general population, but we wanted to know, could we teach them to notice the positive, too, because they really seem stuck on the negative. Are there ways to highlight the positive? So here what we did is we figured out you cannot learn new skills without opportunities. When people tell me they're homeschooling and my kid doesn't do anything, I'm like, okay, well, great. So you have, you're living in a vacuum. There is no way to really teach social skills if you're not being able to get out there and fail as well as succeed because, again, they need opportunities. So you got to get out there and be part of something. And you can't hide from social opportunities. Like I said, there are things you have to kind of deal with, but you shouldn't say, well, they just can't do it. So we had to figure out what skills they start out with and then build on them. And then we had to teach them in small chunks. And then we had to make them very concrete. For every session that we did, we would often get back together and go, well, that didn't work very well, or they didn't get this. And so we did a lot of ways to do that. Then we found ways for them to practice in groups and on their own. And then we tried to include as many people as we could. So peer modeling is really important. Anastasia was talking about that when we have adults and we have, you know, parents. It's really great, but we want to find them ways to connect with each other. And what we did is we came up with a way of connecting groups of five to seven uh, teens and adults with prader willi syndrome in these boss groups. So we found out that individual interests can be a really good starting point. It was nice for our first couple of groups. We knew everybody pretty well. We did have to get them to focus on the right thing. They would focus on what somebody was wearing or doing or if they were following a rule or whatever else. We'd have to sometimes we have to re renegotiate and get you to kind of notice the right things. And we needed to break down tasks into small parts. And we had to practice and practice and practice. 
our big curriculum that we started out with, after like the first three weeks, we just tore it all up and started all over because we realized we thought they would be able to pick up on this stuff a lot quicker. We spent the first three weeks really focusing on specific things. The second three week, the second third kind of doing another thing, and the last was really much more kind of individualized and uh, a lot less kind of facilitator feedback. So the ball study was this virtual reality group. We used a platform called Zoom, which is kind of nice. It's HIPAA compliant. Uh, you get 40 minutes free, which we were all about free, so it was fantastic to be able to do that. And we saw 60 teens and adults over two years and turned them into peer groups. So the thing that's really cool about it is some of our folks are still connecting with each other almost a year after they ended. They have made friends, and that to me is the coolest thing ever because that's what we're trying to do. We made some changes. We uh, adapted the age range to actually have some older adults and some younger adults. We realized that some people, even at 13, could do th things that other kids we thought would have to be 16. So we did that. We added booster sessions. So after the 10 weeks or the eight weeks were done, we actually started like having booster sessions where we could touch it base every few weeks. And it was great because a lot of our kids really loved being able to do that. Uh, we did, we had special ed students who we trained to do it. If it was just me and Haley doing it, we thought really, do, or do we have an intervention here or do we have people that we know who like hanging out with us, you know, three times a week on Zoom. So we actually trained eight special ed students. So they actually ran the curriculum and honestly, they got to be better than we did. So the idea is that for us, developing the curriculum and training people to do it is really cool. So we really do hope that we can, pretty much anybody can do this. And it's written up in a way now where you can follow just right along. Uh, the, the curriculum could definitely work in schools and other places. It could work with other populations, ASD, Down syndrome, Williams syndrome. And we now have a parent manual to help parents support uh, learning at home. One of the concepts we used was, a, are you a firefighter or a fire starter? And I had two parents call me and go, are you telling my kid that they should start fires? I go, no, no, no. We're saying, do you put out fires or do you make them hotter? And one guy would always argue and say, well, I'm, not, I'm neither a firefighter nor a fire starter. I'm a fire promoter. And it was like... Well, however you want to split it, man, it's all good. So for us, it was about kind of coming up with things that they could understand. And we're still, like I said, having them connect with each other. But we do think this could be used in other developmental disabilities, not just PWS. So what we kind of started out with identifying emotions. We realized that in order for them to actually notice what other people were doing, we had to find some ways to kind of relax them. So we did some deep breathing, some other kinds of things to kind of get them to be at a level where they could really start to see things. And we often use the phrase, uh, strong emotions make it hard to see what others are feeling. So even in our lab now, we'll teach each other when somebody's having a bad day. You know, Haley, strong emotions make it hard to see to how other people are feeling. And she's just like, really? You're using boss psychology on me? So it really is true that we had to find a way to do that. And we had them look at the eyes. How are people feeling? Look at the mouth. Is it, does it make sense to you? Do they seem to be feeling the same thing? How do you think it happened that they felt that way? So people started sharing stories about when they felt sad or when they felt scared, and it was really cool. We talked about possible responses. So when people are mad, what do you have to do? We start talking about making choices. So the idea that if somebody's mad, it doesn't mean you have to scream right back at them. You can choose to see what you want to do. And we did lots of practice and lots of praise. There were days that I would just go, not even close to hitting the mark here, but you know, you gotta kind of fake it till you make it. So for us, we tried really hard to praise them when they were doing close to what we wanted them to do. Then we started like talking about listening well. People with PWS have already decided what they're gonna answer, so what you have to say is very unimportant to them, right? So we talked a lot about curbing that impulse to interrupt people, to whatever, so it was about listening, watching for clues, uh, it, we told people a lot, it was like throwing a ball. You throw it to them, they say something, they throw it back to you, you say something, and we talked about that. And then we kind of coached them along. Uh, did you hear what she said? Does that really make sense as far as a response? Well, no. And it was really great because there was such a level of trust that we could say pretty pointed and direct things and they could really hear that. So we love the fact that they, we could sometimes say, yeah, no, that's, that's not right, or that really hurt somebody's feelings. So, we started doing kind of like, they started out with more rote conversations, but they definitely got better as they, as they kind of went along. And then kind of once they got the hang of it, we want to build up speed and complexity. So if we threw the ball once or twice, then we started figuring out if we could throw it six or seven times and could we throw it to other people in the, in the group. It was really cool. And every time they would actually critique their own uh, kind of performance and other people's, how to make it better. So it was really cool to see how they were able to really start to figure out what worked and what didn't work. 
So we focus on emotions, and then we turn to situations. For them, it's conflict, right? Lots of things are conflictual to them. So we talked about putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. And we would often have something where we would act out something between Haley and I. We would have some kind of argument or fight. And then we would help, we would kind of walk through the forgiveness, the kind of understanding and acceptance and kind of moving on. And then they would act as us, which was really cool. It was really great. Apparently I'm very angry and very annoying. And that's what they would act out, but they really love doing that. And then they would do them they're themselves. They would actually come up with the situation that had happened to them and they would act those things out. So that's kind of what we did. We did problem solving, talked about forgiving and forgetting. They generally don't do either of those things. If you have a kid with PWS, you know what I mean. But we did work on some of those skills, and we did a lot of things with them doing things at home. So they had homework they would do, but it was a lot like school. Who did their homework? Nobody did their homework? Anybody want to share their homework? No. Okay, great. I'm glad everyone did it this week. So, so we would did those things. And so we'd often tell parents what the homework was so they could actually help support those things. So it was three times a week. Uh, we really wanted them to stay connected and to combat loneliness. We know that they want to keep friends. They want friends, but they really struggle with making and keeping friends. So we worked a lot on those things as well. So what we have here is these are kind of our, our kind of, we have full data on 50 people. There were a few people that didn't either finish or they didn't finish all of the kind of questionnaire. So the general age range here is, you know, was pretty broad, 13 to 34, but around 20, about, you know, a little bit more females than males. Uh, the genetics work pretty perfectly with what we know is in the general population. 54% uh, were in school. 8% were employed, which is really interesting. We did have a few people who actually had jobs, but again, they're not working 40 hours a week. They may be working six to 10 hours a week at a local pet smart or things like that. 6% were living in a group home. Others had other living arrangements were kind of interesting. We had two people who lived in a kind of a semi-independent living situation. So they weren't living with parents, but they were living with somebody else part of the time and they would often come home on the weekend. So we had some pretty interesting kinds of situations. But it was great because about probably 70% of people that we knew, they'd been in our other studies, but 30% were people that were from all over the place that we'd never met before. So what we did is we had uh, some assessments looking at social responsiveness. And so that's things like how able your child is to kind of interact with other people, to be socially appropriate, to take cues, to be, to kind of say and do the right things. And so it's used a lot for people with autism. And for this, we have things like uh, social communication, cognition, awareness, motivation, and repetitive behaviors. Another thing we used was the child behavior checklist. So we looked at things like anxiety and depression, uh, withdrawal, somatic complaints, or things like aggression, noncompliance, and then things like social thought and attention problems. And Elizabeth had actually just analyzed this data, which was really cool for me, because initially she was like, I don't know that I see a whole lot. But when she realized that when she kind of cleaned up the data and controlled for some stuff, it was pretty cool. The findings were really significant. And not even that, they were across the board that people continue to get better after the study ended, which is what you always want to see. So what we noticed is that social responsiveness scale uh, got better. I mean, that's actually a really significant finding for this scale. And again, it is continuing to go down even post-treatment. So we, what we said is, is that people are continuing to work on these skills, build on these skills. So for us, that went down. Total problem behaviors went down. And again, they're going down over time. So it's not just they're in treatment, things are good. Oh my gosh, treatment is over, everything goes bad. They are learning these skills. And what's really cool is I'm doing the uh, patient focus group. So a lot of the people are actually in that. I am seeing how much like kind of improvement they've made even since boss has ended, like actually how they interact with us. And we had a graduate student and it was a different one every time who would call and do like kind of like a friend call with them. They'd say, hey, it's Chris from, you know, the, the Dykins lab. We're calling to kind of check in with you. And they would have a conversation about things they like to do. They would talk about if they had pets or they had a girlfriend or whatever else. And they'd have a back and forth. So we're videotaping it. We videotaped those and we're coding those as well. So we have sessions we're coding and videotaping. And then we also had inter kind of like an interview, like a friend call. Like if you talk to somebody you didn't know, what would you ask them? How many times do they initiate conversation? How many times do they ask appropriate conversation uh, things like that would be okay to ask a stranger? Sometimes they would ask very inappropriate things like, is your girlfriend hot? And I'm kind of like, yeah, that's not all that appropriate if you don't know that person. I did like the one girl when I corrected her. I said, you know, that maybe is not an appropriate conversation starter. She said, well, how am I ever going to find out if his girlfriend's hot? I go, you got me there. So this idea is that when they want to know something, they really want to know something. 
So as far as some of the SRS uh, subdomains, things like social awareness, again, definitely getting better over time, social cognition getting better, and that's that ability to kind of put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And also cool is repetitive behavior is going down. Some of the maladaptive behaviors are literally getting better. And I tell people, it's hard to do something maladaptive if you're doing something adaptive. So what we're trying to do is kind of crowd out the maladaptive behavior with good behavior so that they can actually realize they can get their needs met without doing kind of odd behaviors that kind of, you know, maybe irritate and annoy others. Uh, some of the internalizing d domains are things like depression, withdrawal, somatic complaints. Again, going down over time, which is really cool. External externalizing behavior are things like temper tantrums, uh, yelling at people, things like that. That's going down. Aggression's going down. Uh, Noncompliance is going down. So we had parents who would often talk about some of the things that they're noticing, even at home, where the kid is actually able to be more flexible. I had a young man who was in one of our groups, and he said something that was it hurt somebody else's feeling. That what's so cool is we did two self-led sessions, and what we did is we had them lead their own sessions. First is kind of facilitators, and at the end it was really just a group project. They talked about their hopes and dreams for the future, and it was really cool to hear what they said. But we had a young man who was talking about how he wanted to get married and have kids and have a family, and it was kind of like, okay. And he said, but, you know, I don't want to marry somebody with Prada Willie. I want to marry somebody normal. And I was kind of like, you get everybody in this group has Prada Willie. And after the session was over, I actually said to him, I said, you know, hey, it, it might have hurt somebody's feelings. How would you like it if somebody said to you, I want to marry a normal guy, not somebody with Prada Willie syndrome? He goes, well, I wouldn't like that. I said, so what do you think you should do? He goes, well, I probably should apologize to the girls and actually the other people in the group. I'm like, what? And it was so cool to listen to him say, that was really kind of cruel for me to say that. I get that that would hurt my feelings if somebody said that to me. His mom said later, she said, well, I've never heard him apologize. So that was a thing in his own right. So this idea that they were starting to see and change how they were actually kind of interacting with others. I, I think the secret sauce to us is the peer interaction. I did love how they would say, so everybody has Prada Willie? Yes, everybody has Prada Willie. And again, some of our folks were very high functioning. Some of them were not very high functioning. There was one guy who didn't say much, but every time he'd come on, he would just be like... He was always in a good mood. He was so excited to be there. And then another guy who would come out and he'd just be like, hey. It's like, oh, great. It's like talking to my 21-year-old. Fantastic. So we really liked the fact that as they started these groups and they kind of built up a friend group, they were actually able to kind of get people out of their shell. People who didn't have a lot to say uh, started to talk more. People who sometimes talk too much started to realize that maybe it was important to be a member of the group and not necessarily the one who ran things. So it was really cool. I would sometimes go, but that's my job to correct people. That's not your job. And they'd go, <sighs> so they love that job. So it was really cool. And I know a couple of our folks, like I said, continue to uh, get together and talk with each other. And it is really cool to hear them talk with each other and the things that they're talking about, people picking on them at school, problems they're having in classes, uh, kind of, again, hopes and dreams. What do they want to do with their life? So what we do know is that there's definitely some improvements in social functioning, cognition, communication, awareness, significant decreases in problem behaviors, aggression, noncompliance, repetitive behaviors, inattention, anxiety, and these improvements are sustained over time, and they, they kind of appear to kind of level out, but the fact that they continue on is really cool because we really wanted to look at six-month post, but to ask parents to continue to you know fill out questionnaires and do interviews felt a little obnoxious. So we ended at three months, but we are definitely seeing some, some changes that can kind of sustain over time. So next steps are, is we're hoping to take, uh, Elizabeth's gonna, this is definitely an Elizabeth thing, hierarchical linear modeling to actually figure out who is changing within a group. So we actually, have, like Anastasia, have people who don't know who these folks are, and they're coding how they interact with each other. And what we're trying to see is that, Everybody doesn't start at the same place, so, you know, some people have more social skills than others. So we're taking everybody where they start, and we're going to track them over time to see how they change. So we did see some significant gains in some of our lowest functioning kids. We had a young lady who could not, she had a really difficult time. The minute she would talk, she would close her eyes, which makes it really hard to see what's going on. It, towards the end, because we talked a lot about, like, looking and noticing things, she would just look into the camera. It was really cute to see how she was really focusing on noticing what people were saying, uh, listening to the tone of their voice, focusing on their face, and again, listening to what people say and want. And so sometimes when they would have sometimes a behavior problem, we would sometimes use those uh, kinds of 
experiences is a learning situation. I had a young lady who uh, got fired from her job for asking too many questions, which should surprise nobody who knows anything about PWS. Her boss got tired of answering her many, many questions. And so she came on one of our sessions and literally, the only time you can always see everybody, we can see everybody, but they can only see like a, like a limited palette of people. If you're talking, you can see that person, they come up big screen, but if they're not, they're kind of small. So she's in the corner and she's crying, but she's not making any noise. So she's just sitting there going, and it was so obvious that she couldn't do anything, she couldn't participate. So at some point I just said, so, so Kayla's having a hard time, she lost her job, she's very sad about that. Can everybody in the group think of one thing to say to her to make her feel better? And buddy Haley looks at me, she says, we're going off script. I go, I know, but we're not gonna, this is like an unsalvageable situation unless we can fix this. So everybody's thought of something really positive to say, and initially it was kind of like, you know, very scripted and whatever else. And the last guy said the most amazing things. He said, Kayla, you are so kind and good with animals. I know that you're going to find another job. And he goes, I bet you anything, if you, you know, apply for another place, you're going to find another job because you're just that good. And, and you know, I was just, I felt so like, you know, pleased and our little babies are growing up. And I said, well, Kayla, how did all that make you feel? And she goes, it was all right. <laughs> so you can't win them all. So it was really interesting to see that. So we're trying to perform to see who gets better over time, who gets worse, any you know, stability issues. And we also ask parents to speak for five minutes about their kid. Tell me about your kid, five minutes, just you know what you think, your relationship. So we're looking at parent characteristics and does that actually kind of relate to their social characteristics? So that's the other thing we're doing. So again, we're trying to see how well people listen, how they respond appropriately, are they on topic, turn taking. And level of insight, because towards the end, the level of insight was just amazing to see the stuff they would say and, and tell each other. And again, one young man told a story of when he had actually had, uh, had stolen food out of a trash can and how somebody, he was just a passerby, pointed him out and stopped other people standing on the street to make fun of this young man who stole food out of a trash can. And he was telling the other kids, and he said, I've never told anybody that story. I haven't even told my parents that. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's so sad. I'm just really sorry for you. And one of the other girls said, that is so not okay. Does the, don't they know you have Prader Willie? That's not okay to make fun of you. He brightened so much about that. And that validation that they got from each other was just, that is the secret sauce, the validation and trust that they had in each other. So we're hoping to publish and disseminate the findings. We're going to produce a manual for the BOSS program so that others can actually use it. We're using uh, the PWS profile to see how it kind of relates to social skills and do that. I'm putting this up there in case anyone has not done the your, your uh, global registry or PATH PWS, but that's the link for the 58 survey. So we're really hoping that we can actually see that our boss skills are changing how people's general PWS behavior is. So again, for all of our families and for FPWR, I want to thank them for the incredible support we've gotten. It has been such an amazing thing. And every time I kind of feel like we've kind of, you know, hit the pinnacle, oh, this is really fun or this is really cool, we find something else to do. And like I said, I don't think we could do that without all the amazing families that we see. So I want to thank them for being a part of it. So I'll take questions if anyone has them. Was that good? You got nothing. Huh? So good. My daughter participated in the study. She loved it. She still she wants it. Like, why isn't it going on anymore? I know. And she has um, Skype play dates with friends that she met from the group. Still, I don't know still, how long ago she participated, but I mean, it's it's been probably at least a year, yeah. right? Yeah. And all the time they call each other and they support each other. Like they talk a lot about. You yeah. know, my teacher. He he ta he brought out crackers today. Can you believe that? You know, it's funny, <laughs> and they just laugh about it. And, yeah. It's <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. So my son's 19, and we talked to him about you know when he's in a group home and when new people come, and I'll say like any new trying to get topics of conversation. And he said, Yeah, there's a new kid here. His name is you know Tom or whatever it is. And I said, Where is he from? I don't know. And how old is he? I don't know. And I said, well, Zach, you know, the good way to find out about people is to ask some questions. And he goes, why would I care about them? And trying to, I know he wants to have friends because he talks about that. But when we give him these cues about, like, you can talk about how you have a dog and ask him if he has pets or mm -hmm. does he have brothers and sisters. And he goes, why do I care? 
And that's his response to almost everything about other people. And there's sort of, you know, the old joke, I don't want to be a club member of a club that would take me mm -hmm. as a member. He said he doesn't want to be friends with people with Prader Willie syndrome, which right. considering he's with people with Prader Willie syndrome, that's those, kind of those be role. your options, right? You're like, uh, right. I mean, yeah. He, I, so he, social motivation is an interesting part of it, and I don't think we actually, for people who are not socially motivated, so there are people who say they want friends, and that's a lot like autism. So people with autism often say they want friends and they feel isolated. But what they struggle with is they want friends who will basically balance, like they want everything that the friend does for them, but they don't care so much about like what they need to do for their part. We really tried hard to get them to realize that if you want what you want, you have to give what you need to give. And so we talked a lot about that, but we did have at least three people that were not socially motivated that definitely kind of veered into the more autism spectrum thing. They didn't do very well in these groups. They wouldn't uh, participate. They had very scripted things like restricted interests that they wanted to ask about. Is anyone into comic books? Well, if nobody was, then they didn't have anything else to ask. I think in that case, you have to figure out how much you want friends. Because if you really want, that's what we told people when they would grumble about what they had to do. Well, if you really want friends, this is what we're telling you works. They were willing to do that. But if you're not willing to be motivated to like do something different, that makes it really hard. So I would say, and it probably shouldn't be you guys. You know, I'm sure a lot of parents, I mean, you probably know this, you've been telling Emma this for years. You could say things to them that we could say that they actually go, oh, okay. But I'm not their parent. So it makes it easier. So maybe the folks at Latham could actually work on some of those things. And this may be a thing for group homes that would be really cool. We did have a group home in New Jersey that had five women who participated, and it was really cool. So all of them were on the calls at once. So it could be something that would be really appropriate for, like, residential settings. Questions? While I'm walking over there, I'll ask you, are any recommendations for parents that they could do yeah, now, I, I, think, I think a lot of it is, is get your kid out there, you know, participate in sports or other things. If there are social groups at your school that maybe are for kids with autism, there's nothing wrong with picking up the skills that work for your kid and being able to be part of that. So anything that you do where your kid is having to accommodate, get along and whatever else, and for a while you will have to coach them and concretely, this is what you say, this is what works and whatever else, and you will find that kids will pick up on those skills. How long does the group clubs picked up? So, so, so the groups met. They're actually over at this point, but they met for, I think it was, uh, I know it was 30 sessions. So I think it was 10 weeks. 10 so weeks, they met three yeah, times a week. I, I will say probably close to February. We're hoping to have everything done by February and have the curriculum out. We're not sure about that, but my thought is, is if you purchase it, it'll be like buying a workbook. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, one more. This will probably be okay. our last. I don't know what time it is. How, so. how many? I was going to say, how many steps have you got now? It's three right, o'clock. Yeah, okay. Two. All right. We have three minutes. Do you notice any gender differences? Um, you know, we did not. I kind of thought we might see some. So we definitely are, I, I don't know that we have enough people. We're going to look at subtype differences. There's definitely subtype differences. Kind of like Anastasia said, our kids with UPD struggle more uh, with the kind of getting stuck on things, maybe, you know, uh, testing limits, arguing, some of those things definitely. But I will say that by the time that the, we got about halfway through the curriculum, a lot of those things had gone away. We, they really were able to accommodate. So I would say no gender differences, but definitely some subtype differences. I think I see one more. If They're always run. the farthest away, right? I know. I'm getting my steps in. Yeah, there right? you go. It's all good. Hi. So um, my question has a little bit more to do with um, peer pressure. So of course, with our kids just trying to interact and make friends with you know the general population of kids at school or youth group or wherever. Um, how how are we able to teach our kids about peer pressure and you know they're so eager to please everybody mm -hmm. else and to make friends but may not always recognize when somebody's actually being facetious or right. misleading or trying to get them to do things that they know that they shouldn't do yeah. but it's kind of a 
well, if you don't do it, we can't be friends kind of a thing? Right. I mean, that's actually a really good question. And I do think it's hard sometimes with the facetious or sarcastic. They don't always get that. I always talk about what is real friend behavior. So if somebody does something, you know, friends don't do things to embarrass you, hum humiliate you. Do so I think it's important to have some of those conversations long before they get to that age. And what I do is I always ask questions. So you know, would a real friend ask you to do something that would embarrass you or, you know, possibly hurt you or whatever else? And for most people, they're like, no, a real friend. So maybe that's not a friend. So we talk a lot about the fact that people sometimes that aren't good for you aren't real friends. So I think it's important to kind of point that out. And that would be true. That's true of even people who are in, you know, relationships that aren't really, like, healthy. So I think it's that same kind of thing, pointing those things out, asking questions, but knowing that you do have to have a level of supervision. Like when people say, well, you know, I want my kid to have independence, it's at the risk of actually sometimes being taken advantage of. So you have to figure out how much you're kind of willing to, to give. And, again, if your kid is in a group where people are constantly doing stuff like that, then you need to find different groups because if that's the people that they're hanging out with, then maybe typical folks aren't maybe what you need to be hanging out with. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anastasia and Elizabeth. Excellent talks, really important area. Okay. I can clap at the... <laughs>